Hey everyone, welcome back to Maple Syrup Tech. I'm Rick, and today we're going to be looking at modding and painting an original NES controller. So by the end of today's video, this controller should look something more like this controller. By the way, this is going to be a project with a lot of downtime. So if you're looking to do what I'm going to do today, I just want to let you guys know before we start that it's a process that I'll condense into about a 20 minute video, but it'll probably take you close to a week of time to get the controller ready because of the downtime between the different steps like plugging some holes in the face of the controller, painting and clear coating and doing the wiring. So. Before we go any more in depth, let's look at the first step, which is dismantling the controller. So sorry to cut in on you guys a little bit from the future here, but uh, I just wanted a quick message for those of you that have started watching the video. Uh, the video actually turned out much longer than I originally intended because uh, halfway through, I really decided to go in depth and do this as a step-by-step -step video. Reason why is we're probably gonna be doing more of these mods in the future. And rather than making each video extremely long, I thought I'd do one really step-by-step -step longer video, which I'll be able to refer to in my future mods, which will be much more streamlined. So if you guys stay tuned in the video, I'll try to throw in some uh, timestamps down below. But uh, the video is a lot longer because we're really going to go in-depth step-by-step for anyone who wants to reproduce a controller of this type or with a different design but along the same lines. So thank you for uh, taking the time to watch my video. Uh, let's get back to it. So here we are. Before we get started, let's go over pretty much everything you'll need. Now this is the essentials and over there, there's a couple of things at the end that we're gonna look at that are optional. However, if you want a cleaner, better uh, build or mod, if you, we, we could say, uh, I do recommend them. But let's go over the essentials. So obviously to start, you'll need an original NES controller. Then for the painting, depending on your color scheme, if you want to match me, you're going to need some red and blue paint. You're going to need some paint primer, which is very recommended as well. And uh, some, finally, some clear coat to finish it off to protect your controller once the paint job is done. For dismantling the controller, you're just going to need a regular Phillips head screwdriver with a small, uh, a small bit. For uh, your lighting solution, you're going to need a combination of resistors and four LEDs. Now the colors and the resistors are going to depend on what you're using. For me, it's blue LEDs with 100 ohm resistors. Uh, for This is a basically a plastic epoxy. It's for basically plugging holes in plastic when you're when you're doing a, a any type of body work normally on an automobile in this case we're going to be using it to plug some holes in the NES controller once we remove the front plate that you're going to see just a little bit later in the video you're going to need this for the project for sandpapers now you can get away with probably two types of sandpaper however I like to use three uh, you're going to want something really rough like some 120 grit. That's just for sanding down. When we're going to be plugging holes in the controller, we're going to have to be sanding down. And for your first few layers, you're going to want some really thick sandpaper because it's going to take forever with the higher grit. Uh, then what I would also actually recommend as well is a finishing block like this, which is somewhere between three and 400 grit. Basically, that all depends on the condition of your controller. If your controller has some scratches and marks that you're gonna have to work out, the three to 400 grit is the best for taking off a, sl a light layer of the plastic on the controller so that you can get to a part of the plastic that isn't scratched or marked. And lastly, what you absolutely need is the 600 grit um, sandpaper because that's what we're going to be using all over the controller to basically remove the sort of clear coat that's already there so that our paint can stick when we're doing our build. Then on the inside, you're going to need a, a soldering iron, a little bit of basic solder, and a hot glue gun. Now the hot glue gun, I have a really, really cheap one and you're gonna see a little bit later in the video, uh, it has some problems. If, if at all your budget allows you, go with a decent quality glue gun, not a cheaper one like I did right here. And if you're going for any type of, if you wanna integrate any type of vinyl stickers in your bill, in your mod, uh, 
I'm going with a vinyl sticker that I'm going to be uh, sticking and clear coating onto the controller. But once again, this isn't an absolute necessity, but if you want to match my build, you're going to need one. And I'm going with a Mario theme, so that's why we have our uh, Mario Mushroom. And now if we look quickly at the optional stuff, by the way, I'm going to try and link as much of this stuff as possible in the description down below. The only stuff I'm probably not going to link, honestly, is like the sandpaper because that you just get at a regular hardware store. You can pick it up online, but I mean, you can search yourself on Amazon for, you know, sandpaper 120 grit for three to 400, a finishing block and 600 grit. Sorry for that. Sorry for that. I almost forgot one of the most essential parts of the build when I was uh, building my little part list here. But um, we're going to need some clear replacement D-pad and A and B buttons. You can pick these up on AliExpress. Do not search for NES controller buttons. Search for DMG Game Boy buttons. We're lucky between the original Game Boy and the uh, NES controller. The D-pad and buttons have the same size and the same fittings, so they will fit perfectly in your controller, but you're going to need these for the build. And now if we get to the optional parts. So the optional parts, because you can use the originals, are replacement rubbers. I, I like to get, because they're, they're really cheap, they're like a dollar for like maybe three, two or three sets on AliExpress once again. I like to get replacement rubbers because sometimes depending on the condition of the inside of the rubbers, if they're too dirty or if they're, they've changed color, you'll see them through the clear buttons. So I like to use replace, a replacement kit to make sure that the look is really clean and that you're not getting like a brownish or an off color when the LEDs aren't on. Uh, I recommend having some uh, shrink wrap for the wires. You'll see that once we combine all the wires together, I use shrink wrap in one spot just to make sure that we don't get any shorts. But if you're careful, you don't actually need it. I just, I, I like better being on the safe side than the, you know, than the sorry side and having to reopen up the controller and fix a short or lose a PCB. Also, what I use is are these quick connects, uh, quick connect um, power uh, power wires. The reason why is because once we've wired the controller on the inside, I want to be able to separate the front plate from the PCB if I need to go do repairs in again. And if you've soldered the wires directly to the PCB, well, the front plate will sort of always be stuck to the to the PCB. So I use these quick connect uh, wires. And lastly, I use a little bit of Kapton tape as well in one spot. Once again, this is to make sure that we don't get any shorts. It's not absolutely necessary, but I recommend it. You'll see me use it in the build. The only thing we don't have here on the table is that you're going to need some extra electrical wires. I recommend 24 ga American gauge wires, which is going to give you, they're going to be strong enough that they can conduct all the current you need for the build. And they're going to be thin enough that they shouldn't pose too much of a problem when you're trying to close back up your controller in the end. I didn't put any here on the table because, I mean, 24 gauge wire is easy to find. I'll link it in the description down below, however, the one that I used. Uh, and, you know, you can get color coded for positive, negative and what that. I recommend it makes it easier if ever you need to do repairs later and you don't remember exactly how you wired the controller. So that's pretty much the parts list. It's a quite a long parts list, but a lot of this stuff is reusable afterwards. So anyway, now let's move on to the first steps. So, so the controller is pretty simple. You have six screws at the back. We're just gonna need a normal Phillips head screwdriver and we're going to go about it. Uh, I'm gonna speed this part of the video up because this, these aren't the hard and essential parts of the video. Perfect, perfect. We have the controller apart. Uh, the first step is that we're going to completely take out the PCB and set it aside because we're going to be working on that later. 
I recommend keeping the rubbers if you don't have some replacements. I'm going to be using replacements to make sure that the rubbers are as nice as possible. And if you want to see a video on how to properly clean the rubbers, I'm going to link it up uh, up at top of the video. I made a video on my channel on cleaning these controllers. For the buttons and the D-pad, I recommend keeping them in case you ever need them on another controller. But for this mod, we're actually going to be replacing them with some clear buttons that we got off of AliExpress. So the next, so the next, we're going to need to remove the front plate on the NES controller. Pretty simply, there's a little hole here at the bottom of the NES controller. You just take your Phillips head screwdriver, you push it in, and you should get the basic front plate that just pops off like that. And then it's just a question of peeling it off easily. So now we have the front of our controller. And it's actually going to pose us the first problem with this mod. If you look, we have the hole we just used to pop off the front of the controller. And there's generally a second hole here. And depending on the exact uh, model you have, basically when it was built, this hole can be smaller or larger. This model actually has one of the smaller holes I've seen. So, But the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to take some putty and we're going to need to seal the holes up. First step in actually plugging up the hole is we're going to need to actually put some kind of backing inside of the uh, rear of the controller to be able to actually have the putty rest on something to be able to plug that hole. Now, uh, this is not the same faceplate we just removed. This is a faceplate that uh, comes from a donor remote that I use that was basically pretty damaged and the faceplate itself had marks and scratches and wasn't if you look here, you can see there was an indent and whatnot. So I used the pl plastic from this faceplate in pretty much all my mods. I cut off little parts and what we're going to do is we're just going to stick a small part right there to uh, block up the hole using some super glue. So you're going to want to put a decent quantity of super glue around the hole, making sure not to get too much inside the hole or actually none at all. And then, like I said, using a part of the donor controller cover, we're going to go and plug that hole. Now you're going to want to make sure that you push down very hard. And I recommend pushing down with two points. So I used the point of a scissor for the other side. And we're going to hold it there for maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Hold on, I'm sure you guys can see properly. So we're going to hold it down for 30 seconds to a minute giving the time for the glue to bond and you want to make sure that it is as flush as possible with the inside so that when you put the putty to fill the hole on the other side it really is as flush as possible and that you have no gaps or holes letting the putty into the inside of the controller. Perfect so the next step right before we put our putty on which is the last preparation step we're, I would recommend cutting out a small piece of sandpaper, not much bigger than this. What we're going to do is we're going to fold it over many times to get it really tiny. And basically this is just to scuff up the inside of the hole so that our putty will have something to really grip onto when we're going to plug those two holes. Now, although the smaller hole model controllers are much easier to plug because the hole itself is smaller, getting the sandpaper in there to scuff up the inside is actually much more difficult. So we're going to start with the bigger hole since I won't need to fold it as much. And basically all you're trying to do is scuff up the inside of the plastic so that when you install your putty, basically it has something to grip onto. So you're going to see a little bit of dust and fabric come off. I recommend for this part using a, a much rougher grit sandpaper because this isn't about aesthetics. This is really about getting some grooves into that plastic and you're just going to rotate like that. So it should be pretty good. And then for the small hole, well, you do what you can. You try to get in there with a corner of the sandpaper, get it scuffed up. If you have a rotary tool with a small attachment, you could actually use that as well. Unfortunately, my rotary tool for the sanding parts have only large attachments on them, so it's not really an option for me. But you see, actually, it looks pretty good. Okay, so for the next step, uh, like I said, we're going to be using some um, putty epoxy to basically fill in the holes. Uh, I use this, which is normally for car repair, but there's a lot of kinds and 
it's important that you follow the instruction for the kind that you purchase around where you live for whatever is available. But like I said, what you want to look for is putty epoxy, specially uh, made for plastics. Uh, you can often find them, like I said, in car repair shops and whatnot. So uh, that's what you want to look for. Now mine is one that you have to work with a little bit first to make sure that it has the right consistency. So I pre-worked it in my hands. Now on the warning normally they tell you don't use your hands to use gloves but I've never had a reaction when I was using it and you only need a little and basically you want to plug the hole. But you have to make sure that you're plugging the hole very very well. And what I want to, what I normally do is I plug it and then I work the sides in to make sure that we have it as properly plugged as possible because since it's such a small hole it's hard to make sure that there's no air bubbles or anything trapped below. Now you don't have to worry about excess what you want to try to do is smooth it out because you'll be able to sand it off later. So basically I always go a little bit excess like this because like I said, for such a small hole, it's really hard to get just that hole plugged. For the second one, it's the same process. The hole's just a little bigger. So you're gonna wanna use some epoxy. You're gonna push it in. You wanna make sure that you get in there deep. Be careful not to push too hard on the bottom of the controller because you can actually rip those out which is what I was checking to make sure that accidentally I didn't push too hard and get that. So same process here you're gonna try and work it in make sure that you filled in the complete gap keep folding it over into the hole working at it and like I said if you're a little worried wear gloves for this I know from past experiences having used it a couple of times that there's no problem on my end. The only thing I don't want is I don't want any of it going into that little space here because that's going to be a pain to try and get out with sanding so I'm using a little skewer here, a wood skewer to make sure we're getting that out. And like I said keep working at it till it's properly plugged. So now once again there's going to be downtime. So you have to follow the instructions on your putty. This one is supposed to have a three hour curing time. I'm going to give it 24 hours just because I want to make sure 100% that we're not going to have to redo this part. Uh, but you know, follow the instructions, go whatever you're comfortable with. Once you're done, you're going to want to sand, we're going to come back and we're going to sand this down to make sure that we have a nice flat surface. So now we're, so now we're sanding. So basically, I'm using three different grits of sandpaper. This is 120, this is 400, and this is 600. So I'm going to start. The first thing we want to do is we want to get the holes that we just plugged. We want to get the extra compound really flush with the surface and take off all the excess um, compound that we used to block the holes. So I'm going to start with some really hard grit. Now you're going to want to make sure that everything above the 600 you try to touch the plastic as little as possible because it will actually damage the plastic. However, when you get down to the 600 and you're almost flush, you'll be able to really scratch all over the controller because once we're done getting these flush and getting all the excess off, we're actually going to take the 600 and go all over the controller to remove the protective layer on the plastic so that the paint will stick once we get to the painting. So. Um, I, as you see, have cut small pieces because it's much easier to sand with small pieces and you will waste less sandpaper that way. So uh, enjoy watching and we'll get the uh, next step, we'll be getting to the painting. For the back of the controller. 
So um, the front of the controller, as you can see, um, was a little bit off color, but there was no major damage, no major lines, no major problems with the front of the controller. So you can see the back, if you don't see properly, it's actually pretty damaged. Like there's a lot of scratches, a lot of lines. If we paint over this, you're gonna see those lines, those scratches. And using the 600 grit uh, sandpaper, it's not really gonna remove these lines. So I'm actually gonna use a 320 grit sanding block to actually take a layer of plastic off the back and try and get these lines out so that when we paint over it, it makes a nice clean paint finish. Uh, the one thing you want to be careful though is do no, if you want to keep the official Nintendo branding here, do not s use this to sand over that. Just scrape that with the 600 grit anyway if you look. I have no scratch marks on that section so it's not going to be a problem aesthetic wise. Uh, so we're going to go over it with the block, we're going to take all the scratches off and we're going to uh, then continue on and we're going to finish at the end once again with 600 grit to make it nice and even. So now that we got these controllers nice and sanded, uh, we're just I'm just going to take them quick for a rinse because you're going to want to get all that uh, dust and so just a rinse in normal soap and water. Let them dry off and then we're going to set up to paint. So uh, the painting process is going to be, it doesn't take very long but there's a lot of downtime in it once again. So we'll look that over and uh, we'll, I'll see you guys in a few seconds. So here we are set up to paint. So basically, since I'm going to be going with two different colors for the bottom and um, bottom and top of the controller, it was really important that I set up two separate parts because we're not going to be using the same color. There's a few steps that are going to be common. For example, we're going to be putting primer on each one of the controllers first, and we're going to be finishing with a semi-gloss uh, clear finish. But in between, we're going to be putting different layers of colors, so we want to make sure that your two setups are far enough apart that you can freely paint on each without getting any color on the other. So basically, uh, just to get you the steps, we're going to be doing only one layer of uh, primer. Then we're going to be doing between two, or two and three layers of each color with 15 minute wait times in between each. But it's important for you guys to know, to find out with the type of paint you're using, type of you know primer and the type of clear, what exactly the steps and times are. These, it's 15 minutes between each coat and I have to put the, the clear directly on after, after the paint or else you're going to get some wrinkling or maybe some cracking on the paint. I will also be installing a vinyl decal which I'll be putting after the first step of the clear. Basically I'll be installing the decal on the back of the controller and then I'll be putting two more layers of uh, clear over the decal so that it's really into the controller as if it was part of the painting design. You'll feel a little bit edge over it, but it'll be there forever. So let's get started. I'm not really gonna give you guys a painting lesson because to begin with, I'm passable, but not great at it. I've learned you know, on the fly and I'm sure there's some videos out there that can teach you the steps better than that. So you guys will see this part in Accelerated once again, uh, going through each step really quickly.
we are 48 hours later. The aesthetics of the controller are done. We're going to start working on the insides, but so far it's looking pretty good. So keep following and we'll be doing the wiring next. So into the first part of our solder job. Um, we're going to be using a couple of uh, quick attachments like this. The reason why I'm going to be using this is number one, uh, I don't want anything permanently connected to the PCB here. So using one of these allows me to disconnect the front face plate when I need to, meaning that if ever we need to go back into the controller for any kind of repairs or any type of other modification, uh, it'll still be 100% separable to take the front face plate off of the PCB. So I use these quick ties, you can get them easily very cheap online. I think I paid about a buck fifty for about ten of them. Uh, they come in pairs like this, so you've got a male and a female. And basically, what you're going to do is I'm going to attach the female part to the PCB. And honestly, on the PCB side, this is the only job we're going to have to do directly with the controller PCB. The rest is going to be in the front face plate. So. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to attach your ground wire to the last one down here and you're going to want to attach your positive wire to the first one which is your five uh, your five volt rail right here so let's get that done really quick and then we can move on to uh, getting ready to modify the inside of our pcb Perfect. Here we go. I decided to, as you could see, to add a little bit of solder because I found that these leads had, you know, were a little on the low side on the solder side. So I added a little bit of fresh solder just to make sure that we have a really good, clean connection. And uh, now that we're done with the PCB, we can move on to getting ready to installing the LEDs in the faceplate. So the next part is we're going to get the LEDs ready to install on the faceplate. So just to make things simple, uh, the exact resistance you're going to need for each for your setup is going to be different depending on what colors you're going to use. But for mine it's 100 ohm resistor. So what I'm going to do is I clip off one side really short and we're just going to join to each positive side of all the four LEDs I'm going to be needing for the mod. I'm going to be joining the resistor to the positive side. Positive side is the longer leg. The reason I do this before we start working is number one, it's hard to do when you're inside the faceplate and number two, by attaching it before, I won't need to look around to find out which side is positive once I'm working. It'll be very easy visually to detect which side is the positive side because it's the one that's going to have the resistor attached. So I'm going to do the first one here and then I'm going to repeat the process on the other three. You guys are only going to see the first one because it's an exact reproduction on all four uh, LEDs. So basically we're just going to start by, you know, tinny, putting a little bit of solder on the edge of the LED, tinning it up. Then you're just going to reheat it. And join your resistor. And you have the resistor attached to the positive leg. So we're just going to redo that three more times on the other resistors and don't worry about the other leg, we can trim it down later depending on exactly how we're going to set it up inside the faceplate. We're back work, back work faceplate. So basically we're just going to cut the grooves we need to install the LEDs in our faceplate. So if we flip it over, I'm going to use a rotary tool but you could use an X-Acto if you don't have one of these. And the point is that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be cutting the grooves where we're going to be installing the LEDs. Now, the best placement I found for the LEDs will be for the A and B button will be right here in each corner, which we're going to basically just cut a groove. And then for the D-pad, I found that in opposing corners here is the best place to place them to make the wiring after easy. So I'm going to get my rotary tool going and we're going to start cutting these grooves into the controller. OK, 
Okay guys, so now we're gonna do the uh, installation of the LEDs in the front face plate. I'm gonna using, so I used, I already put one in here. I used some hot glue. You can actually use quite a bit. It's not too bad as long as you make sure to keep uh, it clean on the inside. And you also wanna place your LED in the hole poking out but you want to make sure that it is not anywhere inside the hole that would actually interfere with the motion on the button. Now there are other ways of placing the LEDs. I'm placing them in the way that I found most efficient to set up my circuit. Now because I'm using blue LEDs that actually pull quite, quite a bit of um, voltage I've had to set up all four lights in parallel. So this is a, probably the hardest way to set up four lights in a faceplate which is good for going for a first project because if you manage to use lower uh, voltage lights and you set them up in series it's actually going to just mean less wiring and an easier time for you guys. So we're going to start with the blue LEDs. Like I said, you can use actually quite a bit of hot glue to make sure that they don't move around in there. Because once you have them set up, you want to make sure that you don't have to go back in to install to move around the lights. So I, I use just a bit to get it positioned. Once I have it positioned to my taste, you know, I generously add some all around. The important thing is just that the front stays as clear as possible so that the light peeking out the front, you know, actually lights up pretty, pretty bright. So we've got two set up. Now we're going to let them cool off while we set up the other two in the bottom. So I've got another one here. This one we're going to set up actually in this fashion we're just going to bend this one first a bit because we're going to want it twirling around the side here so a decent glob of glue there just want to go in quickly before it hardens and starts cooling get our LED positioned so that like I said, it's shining brightly in the hole, but without peeking out. So it doesn't interfere in the motion of the D-pads and the buttons. Now I'm using some really cheap um, hot glue, by the way, which is why it's, it's sort of going into filaments like this. Unfortunately, I'm out of the good stuff right now. And it's globbing all over. So it's going to be a little icky on the inside for the glue side but I mean quality wise and staying solid it's going to be perfectly fine it's not going to actually affect any of the issues give me just a second it's really globbing up on this one anyway once it cools down it'll be easier to break off and clean off all these little filaments um, and we're going to place our last one up here, which we're going to angle like so. So one last big glob of hot glue. Yeah, I really have to buy a better gun. I went cheap on the hot glue gun and this is going to be, this is not going to be good. We have to clear it out of the out of the, you know, like I said, we don't want any poking actually through to interrupt with the D-pad, so like that. And then we will just hot glue over and around it. There we go. So pretty shitty job filament wise, but I'm going to clean it all up and it's going to be perfectly fine once I get all of this garbage out of the way. Like I said, inv investing in some really decent hot glue is going to save you a lot of time and a lot of headaches. So don't do like me and don't go cheap on that stuff. I wanted to try it out since it was only like a dollar for 20 sticks. And honestly, I'm sort of regretting that I didn't just go with the good stuff right away. Because in the end, I'm probably going to end up buying the good stuff anyway. So overall, it was like wasting a buck. There we go. Okay, just 
position it correctly. This one here looks fine, but there's some glue at the front. So hopefully we'll get a lot, enough light going through it anyway. So we're getting pretty close to the end. Now that we have this all set up, I'm just gonna let it dry for, you know, dry and harden for about like half an hour. And then we're gonna try and find and finish up the wiring. Okay, so now for the wiring. If you see here, I placed only one wire. Now, just to let you know, I'm gonna shorten these wires a lot, okay? I just like having them longer till I'm all set up so that I know exactly where to cut them. And since I have quite a bit of wire, I don't mind going longer. Now, honestly, I'm going to try and explain to you guys as easily as it is to set up this, but I would recommend you going and checking out videos on setting up parallel circuits and, and series circuits, because like I said, the exact wiring is gonna be very different depending on the exact LEDs you're using and the exact setup you have. But basically, I'm going to have three ground points, one, two, and three, that I'm going to have to bring together and join to the ground point on this common ground here, which is gonna come plug into our PCB. For the positive side, I'm going to be able to bring the two positives here together and the two positives here together and make a, so two common positive wiring systems that we're going to plug into the positive side, which is gonna set up all four LEDs in parallel. Okay, so basically I'm going to set this all up. We're gonna look at what it looks like in the end. What's very important as well is this point here is probably the biggest point where you could have a potential uh, short circuit because you have the two positives sticking out here on the side and the negatives in the middle. So what I would recommend is either using, I'm gonna be using some capped on tape that I'm going to be taping it down to the front plate. Or what you can do is if you have some shrink wrap, you can shrink, shrink wrap the positives here to make sure that they won't short against the negatives here. So other than that though, if you keep everything down to the ground and what I'm gonna do at the end is I'm going to actually put some hot glue over the major points to make sure that all this wiring stays really stuck to the face plate. So as long as you do that, you should really have no short problems. And if you're really going on the cheap, what you can always do is rather than using Kapton tape, you can always put a glob of hot glue right here in the middle to sort of isolate it because basically whatever's in the hot glue isn't gonna to be touching anything else. So I'm going to set it all up and we're going to look at what it looks like in the end. Perfect, so here we are about 45 minutes later. I've set up all the wiring. So as you can see, we have the one, two, three ground points all joining up here to the black wire. We have the two, uh, the two resistors here joining up together to one red wire and the other two re resistors here joining up to another red wire joining us here at our junction point. So what that gives us is it gives us all four LEDs in parallel, meaning that they'll be all getting the maximum voltage. I'm using 100 ohm resistors because with my LEDs, which are three to 3.5 volt LEDs, uh, 100 ohms should be pushing somewhere between three to 3.2 uh, volts, meaning that we'll have a very good lighting on the LEDs. So all we have left to do now is uh, insert our buttons and we're going to be using the brand new uh, replacement rubber pads here. So we're going to reassemble our controller. We're going to install our clear buttons which uh, if you look at the uh, parts list are basically clear Game Boy buttons, the original Game Boy, the DMG-01 for those looking for the parts on AliExpress. Uh, anyway, you know, at the, if you want, go back to the beginning and look at the full parts list, everything will be there. So I'm gonna assemble all that. I'm not gonna do it on camera. You guys saw me put it, take it apart. It's basically the same thing in reverse. The only difference is we're plugging this in before we're uh, screwing everything back together. And we'll meet again to see the controller, what it looks like finished and test it out. So, so guys, back with the finished product. So as you can see here, it's plugged into the Nintendo. I think the controller turned out pretty well and you guys should be getting a close-up close of it again uh, right now. 
but I'm actually really happy with the way it turned out. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, when you do things by hand like this, it rarely is, unless you're extremely exper you know, experienced in it. But I think, you know, if you guys are looking for an easy mod, giving a little flair to one of your old controllers, um, you need a little bit of getting used to the rounded buttons, but other than that, I mean, it, pre it plays perfectly well as a normal controller, and just so that you guys can see that it's still perfectly functional. Um, favorite game for testing here, Castlevania. Game is starting up. We've got D-pad, left, right, everything is working, responding perfectly, crouch, we got jump, we've got the whip. So everything is perfectly fine on the controller now. So thank you for sticking with me throughout this video. I did it really slow pace this one as a sort of how-to step-by-step. Uh, I plan on doing a lot more mods like this. It'll be along the same lines, but different designs, different you know ideas for mods. Uh, the future ones will probably be much more streamlined, much more quick, and I'll refer to this one as anyone who wants to reproduce this as a step-by-step -step video. So this is why I made this one a little bit longer. So, hope you thank you guys once again for watching. As usual, leave a like down below if you guys have any other controllers you'd like to see, any other type of mods, any ideas. You know, I'm always open to them. I can't tell you I'll do them all, but if they're a good idea and I, I get a good idea of how to do it, I, you know, I'm always open to them. So thank you for watching and I hope I'll see you guys in my next video.